Welcome to Earth Science Resources. Today we're speaking with Dr. Chris Maupin. He is an Associate Research Scientist at the Texas A&M University. Um, I am Dr. Chris Maupin. I'm an Associate Research Scientist at uh, Texas A&M University. Um, I manage the Stable Isotope Laboratories on campus uh, and also get to do a bit of my own research when time and, and finances allow. Um. So most of my daily responsibilities are focused on um, really making sure all of the mass spectrometers stay operational, um, stay generating the data that students and clients uh, need. Um, we have like an incredible state-of-the-art mass spec facility here that is uh, second to none um, so it's it's pretty close to like if somebody needs a specific type of isotope analysis like they can seek us out and and we can probably do it there's only a few like really really unique situations that are not kind of well explored in the literature that we that we would not be able to do routinely um, and then a lot of that comes with um, running instruments and teaching students how to run instruments and how to maintain them and, and troubleshoot and, and kind of diagnose what's going on from the different symptoms that they see. And um, hopefully they'll be able to take something away that if they choose to work in, you know, any lab type environment, they can take the skills that they've, that they've acquired, you know, puttering around here and kind of helping us out and getting there, you know, we have undergrads, masters, PhDs all working together in the same facility, getting data for, for their own projects and helping the facility um, serve the, the geosciences community. So that's a pretty, it's a pretty good summary of the day-to-day -day stuff. Um, the non-day-to-day -day stuff, so my research interests are um, kind of, they are stable isotope chemistry related but also kind of like paleoclimate so i'm interested in um really like thunderstorm variability and like the tropics in the mid latitudes over the over the last like you know million years um and kind of using different proxies to tease out like what's going on in the atmosphere and like how is the hydrologic cycle um and like all of its components, how are they contributing different um, kind of parts of variability to the sum whole of like what we end up getting when that rainwater makes it say into a cave and forms a stalagmite. How do we actually link those two things together? Like how can we tell, is this a stronger thunderstorm? Did the source of moisture change? So I'm really interested in kind of, so my background is primarily like chemistry and oceanography. And so the chemistry part really helps guide like my research and kind of where I see um, kind of interesting little niches, especially like for stable isotope things. Yeah, it's always fun. So that's kind of, and, and I love also getting uh, undergrads involved um, in the research I do. Um, I actually had a couple undergrads recently who, uh, they were working on a cave project with us and they they did a, two really, really nice uh, undergraduate honors theses and um, they ended up presenting their work at AGU um, as seniors uh, and then they ended up as co-authors on uh, the paper that came out of the research. So yeah, they were, they contributed the whole way through and it was a great experience and like, you know, I, I love working with undergraduates because my introduction to research was primarily like as an undergrad. I had a really, really great experience. Um, a PI needed uh, help on a Gulf of Mexico oceanographic cruise. Um, and it was primarily geochemistry. So like red tide, like how does it kind of get its nutrients? And is this, this cyanobacteria that's called uh, uh, trichodesmium how does it play a role in, in supplying that to potential blooms and uh, how does it contribute overall to the nitrogen cycle? So, you know, it wasn't glamorous work, but it was like you got to go out to sea and see what real oceanographic research was like from, you know, I, I don't know what 
made them like, desperation because I was I just finished my freshman year of college, but uh, I had a great time and it was that was it. It was like, yep, yeah, I, ch I chose the right path. So um, yeah, that's a long answer to to your short question. <laughs> I am I was born and raised in Florida, kind of coastal Florida, south of like Tampa Bay area. Um, just spent as much time as I could as a kid, like outdoors on the water, um, and like was really, really into science, like from a very, very young age. But it was really like kind of starting to be so. Two things really happened that were that like made a big impact on me. The first was um, our county and area had these net bans that went into effect um the gill nets and all of a sudden like it was like magic all of like the pompano and stuff started coming back to like grass flats and stuff you were catching stuff like you know that you never caught and so you got to see like oh like it this matters in very young age and then also you know seeing the everglades kind of go to a hill and watching the coral reefs kind of die as I kind of grew up and became an adult. Like, it's it's insane, you know, I can see pictures in my mind of, of photographs I've seen from like the 70s and stuff and what s stuff looked like down there. And then, you know, I can still picture like the first time I saw that stuff. And then I can also picture the last time I saw that stuff. And it's, yeah, so that kind of really, it got me involved in in coral conservation at first, um, and it really steered me towards you know corals are kind of like this weird like animal that's just a, like a, a geochemical factory, and you know you're in the ocean, so it's like okay, chemical oceanography um, is is a really good kind of path forward to understand what we don't quite understand yet uh, with these animals. And this was like 2006, 2005, 2006, I would say. Um, I helped out at uh, Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium, like doing rescue corals that we had, uh, we brought back from, from uh, a, kind of a whole project that was coordinated with the National Marine Sanctuary and everything. And kind of got to get them like reestablished in captivity and like an educational display and stuff like that. Um, and then kind of naturally through one of my um, undergraduate uh, professors connections at the University of South Florida, I met uh, um, Ben Flower, who's no longer with us, unfortunately. Um, well, this is depressing. Dave Hollander, who is also no longer with us, um, and uh, Terry Quinn, who uh, would take me on as a student, like a thesis student, um, when I was like right the summer of my between um, junior and senior year, I was out there every day. It was like I went to Eckerd College, which is a little liberal arts college, um, right on the kind of the end of St. Petersburg, like the end of Pinellas uh, Peninsula. And it's like a five minute, 10 minute drive to get to the University of South Florida's like lab, their stable isotope lab. And, uh, and so I would go down there every day during the summer. And then even the semester after, I would get myself in trouble with coursework, kind of slacking off and jetting down there to to do stuff for my project because I was so into it. Like that's, you just hyper-focused. Um, and it was working with kind of corals and, and stable isotopes and reconstructing um, different things about the water column that the coral was growing in. So temperature, um, kind of evaporation, precipitation, moisture balance um, over the site. So, you know, some people kind of make the inference of salinity if you have like a calibration for the oxygen isotopes of the water and the salinity of the water. Um, so you can get a lot of like, and there's even more stuff that people are doing with corals nowadays. And so I, that was 
that just you you it, when you run those samples from your first like one that you've drilled and corals grow so fast like the instruments are capable of measuring like in the case of the coral I was working on for my my undergrad you could have gotten you know, 100 samples a year if you wanted very fast growing but you get the data and it's just this annual cycle like it, you're just like this is incredible you know it's like magic you know just a thermometer that's just been growing there for you know however many years and so that got me really into like I committed I went all in um, with Terry and when I uh, I did my thesis defense on that project and he offered me a master's uh, position right after they said I passed so um, yeah that was a good day so that was 2006 um, my master's um, I did at USF um, my advisor was kind of he was at UT at that point like he was kind of working on he was technically on sabbatical but also kind of like working on making the move there and uh, so when I was at USF I ended up working with um, another Atlantic coral species uh, Sideraastria sideraria and so there's a few species in the Pacific that work really well for paleoclimate proxies. Um, in the Atlantic, it's been a bit scarcer. It's been a bit more difficult to find a good species where it's like, this is a great geochemical record of sea surface conditions over like the past, you know, in some cases, three, 400 years. Um, and it's a shame because you, you know, the ones that look like the ideal candidates, you know, they have like the density banding, just like tree rings. They're some of the most difficult to actually like get in there and sample and turn into a powder where it's like, that's what you get in the instrument. Um, and, and so there's kind of like that field installed a, a little bit, I think. Um, and Terry's group was the only one that was really trying to like, you know, push through and cause it was important, you know, to have, to have these kind of parallel records. We were generating, lots of groups were generating records from, you know, these incredible places in the Pacific for kind of reconstructing El Nino, Southern Oscillation, and, and you know, anything you like, or like South Pacific Convergence Zone variability. And, and in the Atlantic, it's like, we're having a hard time. And so I kind of, I was familiar enough with corals at that point that I recognized, um, the species in a core and it had been slabbed already so, like and when it was slabbed it just looked like a perfect like line going growing like right straight through I'm, just, I'm gonna do a literature search immediately like has anybody like tried to do this one because this like this one will probably work um, or I'm sure gonna kill myself trying to make it work um, and yeah it was actually way easier than it should have been it was just like these we started getting the data and it's these beautiful annual cycles that are right on top of temperature for where the coral was growing. And you know, one of those things where like, I'm sure you've had these moments where your advisor's like, that's not right, or, like, that's too good. Like, oh, you're like, nah. And, and you know, you replicate it and it's like, okay, <laughs> continue, you know? And that was my master's and that was really cool. Like it was, and now it's a really, really widely used species like in the ever like since 2008 there's been like you know I think there's been several papers that have used it um and are still using it in fact uh, should be hopefully some more coming out in the near future um but yeah that's that's my master's and then Right before I was going to defend, Terry, my advisor, decided that he was, or he had probably long decided, but he announced that he was going to um, move to UT and that he was going to have a lab built, renovated, and uh, he asked me if I would come help him set it up. And this part requires a little bit more backstory. While I was working at USF, um, I had an incredible mentor, um, Ethan Goddard. And Ethan ran the lab for the three paleo folks, for all the stabilized folks. Um, and 
he had moved down from Florida. He had worked um, for Dan Schrag, who was at Harvard up at his lab and had run, you know, his lab. Moved down to Florida, uh, and we just happened to overlap. And he was like, I'd always been very like working on stuff like tinkering like you know lawnmowers cars boats all that stuff you know and so anytime there was a problem with the the instruments and i would be like you know curious and he would notice and so basically just started became like some days it felt like like click and clack from do you remember uh the car um The Tapper Brothers from uh, Car Talk on NPR. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The Austin Brothers. Yeah. So it was kind of like that. Like, we were just, like, you know, we would, we would like, have each other in stitches, and but we would be, like, also, like, figuring things out. And I'm, like, I'm kind of in disbelief that, you know, this guy who's, you know, resume is, is he's very humble. Like, he doesn't like, he'd kill me if he ever saw this. Um, it, it's, uh. Yeah, he was just like super treated me as a as like a peer and we're trying to figure something out and like he he showed me that like you made more progress when you stayed open minded and you let yourself be surprised and you let yourself be wrong. Um and like that resonated with me like a lot and kind of has stayed really one of my top priorities just to keep trying to do you know you're not always successful but like you know you're always it's just kind of one of those things that I found a brilliantly inspiring personality trait and tried to emulate that because it was it was inclusive you know and it, it didn't it didn't discriminate based on any ability and any and like it was just it was great. Like you want to learn, we'll teach you. Like that, and that's that's what I do here to this day. Like anybody who comes in who's not even a part of the isotope PI like kind of cadre, it's still like yeah. And you de you determine your own involvement. Like if you if, or your advisor like is interested in having you learn the the instrument, come on down. We'll do it. We'll we'll take you as deep down the rabbit hole as you want to go. Um, yeah, and and so I think. That was why Terry ended up asking me to come to UT. And so I ended up doing my PhD there while trying to run that lab. And um, then, so my PhD project was uh, looking at fast growing speleothems from Guadalcanal and the Solomon Islands and slow growing corals. Um, I branched out to the Pacific because Sidorastri was a slow growing coral and it worked really well. And the corals that are typically used in the Pacific grow really, really fast. And you get this big, you get, if you see a, like a head the size of a Volkswagen, you're like, that's gonna be the best proxy record ever. And you core that thing and then you get an x-ray and you, like, it was happy. It, that's why it was so big. Cause that sucker was trucking like two centimeters a year. And so you get these huge things like a two meter core is only like, now it's a hundred years long and that's, it's like, but there's other species that people had done a little bit of work on, some fantastic work on actually, and I'm surprised it's taken um, people longer to kind of adopt it in a more widespread sense. Um, it's a slow growing coral called Diploastria heliopora, and it's only like three to seven millimeters a year. And these things are sometimes it seems like they're unkillable because they will be in what looks like the ugliest place ever on like rocky cliffs and like a an uplifting like section of reef in Vanuatu and you'll you can court them like 400 years old 300 years old like in just these little and so there's real big ones out there that I have seen personally and a lot of other people have seen so um in fact I still am working on kind of publishing the record from my dissertation that was the slow grown coral. Um, so that's kind of how I got into caves as well as that project because nobody had really worked with 
um, super fast speleothems from um, the tropics. So we were starting to like find these random ones that had this really interesting like growth fabric to them. And it was like, you would get like the uranium thorium dates back, which is how we typically date um, speleothem calcite and aragonite. And you like the, the numbers were like, normally in a speleothem this big, you know, you'd be expecting the numbers to be in the thousands. And it was like, this is like less than a hundred years. And you're like, but so a super high resolution, absolutely dated with uranium thorium record of precipitation from like the South Pacific convergence zone. I was, I was in heaven, like, and then like being able to just go out there and do the work and find the cave again. And yeah, it was just an, incredible. That was about 2010 and came back, you know, it was just really stressful once I came back was really when I started like wrestling with, okay, like uh, my project's all set. Now I'm worried about like what I'm going to do next. And it's like, what I really just want to be able to do science, but you know, there's, there's so few people who are able to be like dedicated technicians at a level where they're like, paid hard money and they know they have the background of like taking all these things apart and stuff like you know kind of it's yeah so it, it's a bit unusual and I was like there's no way I'm going to be able to get that for myself and even if I tried and like very you know was very stressed about the whole prospect of like I don't the postdoc stuff and the moving again and the, like I, I didn't I didn't want it like I knew I at that point like it was not you know I'd come all the way through without stopping from undergrad and I was like I knew at that point what I wanted and so it was like all right I'm gonna started this job in summer 2013 um, I was still writing my dissertation and um, every I, I had a lot of skeptics about how I was not going to finish. Um, they shall all remain nameless because um, there were also a lot of incredibly supportive people. Um, and uh, I managed to wrap it up and uh, get it done. And so then, you know, it was all the doors were open here to, to doing any kind of science um, that we could, you know, that made sense that we could that we could do. Uh, yeah. I'm sure that's a, an abbreviated version. Come back tomorrow, you probably get a completely different one. Um, yeah, so that's it's a long tale. <laughs>